China's battle with COVID-19. How has the country responded? What is the latest situation? And what about the economic impact? Hello, I'm Arnold Neider and this is The Heat. China has made extraordinary progress in battling COVID-19 since the first major outbreak in Wuhan earlier this year. While the disease is largely contained in China, the country is now responding to a minor outbreak in the city of Qingdao in East China's Shandong province. About 9 million residents are being tested after a small number of positive cases were linked to a local hospital. Meanwhile, there's good news for China's economy with new figures from the IMF projecting growth for 2020. We have a great panel to discuss all of this. Joining me now from Beijing is Aina Tangen. He is a political and economic affairs commentator. With us too via Skype from Shanghai is Dr. Richard Cheng. He has treated COVID-19 patients and is a consultant to Chinese hospitals. Also joining us via Skype is Peter Chen Hong. He is a professor of medicine and infectious diseases at the University of California, San Francisco. And from Portland, we're joined by Yan Liang. She is a professor of economics at Willamette University. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. Anna Tangle, let me start with you. China has done very well in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we do have this small outbreak right now in the city of Qingdao. Overall, where does the country uh, stand? Is this outbreak largely contained in China? Well, it's all about measures and, and the ability to literally just say, you know, within the three day period, we're going to test nine million people. Uh, that's incredible. You start looking at that in comparison to any other country in the world at this point, and they're just not those capabilities. One of the reasons that uh, China has been able to open up is this, um, these protocols that are in place, which allow it to act, act extremely rapidly. And this is a very big contrast to what has happened in the U.S., where it seems testing is a dirty word, as, as are face masks, or I shouldn't say dirty, a political word. Anna, when you say protocols are in place, what protocols are these? Well, uh, quite frankly, it's testing and tracing and treatment. Uh, what happens as soon as there is any type of outbreak, uh, everybody who's associated with that is quickly notified. They're put immediately into quarantine. And then on a general basis to make sure, uh, the government will institute testing of everybody uh, in the city because they do not want this kind of uh, outbreak. I mean, this, this is the kind of gold standard right now uh, for any country in the world. Just the sheer ability to react as quickly as they are able to, and as I said, on a massive scale, to uh, implement these types of uh, testing. Dr. Richard Cheng, as Ina said, you know, the fact that China was able to test 9 million people in just a few days, as he pointed out, that's incredible. But why uh, do they test such a huge number of people when there are only just a few uh, number of positive cases? Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, as Ina in Beijing uh, pointed out, they do take these issues very seriously. And, uh, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, the, they test a large number of people in Qingdao. Well, tries to, they try to catch a few bad guys. Well, i like to add, in addition to what Aina has said, uh, they use a massive uh, um, tracing uh, technique. Uh, by, uh, they call it the green code, basically by the mobile phone, as you know, the GPS uh, positioning. So this is a very uh, powerful uh, recognition or positioning uh, uh, via mobile phone, and uh, they can treat everybody travels around in the country needs to demonstrate on their mobile phone where th their whereabouts in, in at least last uh, two weeks, and they can do these, you know, by the so-called big data um, IT manipulation. They can identify people who were close to or nearby the outbreak center very quick very, very quickly and, uh, and uh, lock their uh, place down. So that's pretty 
when technologies like this is you uh, are used in situations like this in the COVID-19 public health issues, they are very powerful. Yes. Right, Dr. Cheng. So China will have tested uh, nine million people within five days in this particular area where there's been the outbreak. What does that level of testing tell us about the country's overall approach to combating the pandemic? Uh, they are all out on preventing and uh, locking down of the suspicious places. So there's no question about it. And this is still, uh, it's a trade-off, as we know. Um, uh, if you, you know, uh, as, we, we, as we have seen, these uh, minor breakouts happened in, in Beijing earlier and uh, in some other parts, uh, in Harbin uh, a couple of months ago, now in Qingdao. And uh, it, it's a it's a, it's a trade-off, and I'm glad to say that the minor breaks, uh, outbreaks in Beijing will crack down pretty quickly. So whether you have a short lockdown or longer lockdown, the economic impact and uh, the social impact, these are the questions uh, more broader than that. Uh, they're much broader than just a medical question. So to me. These are necessary if, uh, measures, yeah. This is, the, as you know, still the, uh, the top priority of the government uh, nationwide. All right, let's go to uh, Dr. Peter Chin Hong. Uh, Peter, um, if we look at this mass testing in China, it stands in very stark contrast to what we're seeing here in the United States. Uh, and we have talked about this before on this show, about the lack of a national strategy uh, here in the United States. Why has China been so successful when here in the United States, we're actually hearing warnings now that the death toll could be as high as 300 to 400,000 uh, in a very short space of time. Uh, thanks for having me on again, Anand. Um, I think, again, like you said, it's really the lack of a national strategy. And what our political leaders did early in the pandemic is to relinquish control of many aspects of the disease control to the states. And we all know that state borders are porous. They don't act as autonomous countries. So unless you have disease screening and intelligent uh, border control, you're not going to do anything. And of course, you can't do that in the United States. So you either have a national strategy, and if you don't, then you have the repercussions. Right. And I guess the other problem, Peter, is that this has become so politicized in the United States that we have different responses and approaches in different states, depending who's the leader of the, or the governor in each respective state, whether they're Democrat or Republican. Exactly. Um, you know, right now I'm reading about the big surge in Wisconsin. And to give you some perspective, they're debating whether or not mass, there should be a mask mandate. You know, that's old news from many months ago. That should have been part of their ethos from a long time ago. The very fact that they're talking about it at the state level tells you how far along and how different every state is from each other. All right, well, let's talk about the economic impact of all of this. And there, there is some good news. Yang Liang, uh, the IMF has released new figures on Tuesday, forecasting that China's economy will grow by 1.9% this year. This is the, the only major economy in the world to show growth. Last year, the Chinese economy grew by just over 6%. Uh, there's also another bit of good news from the IMF, and they say that the Chinese economy uh, will probably grow by 8.2% next year. Um, the World Bank also issued a similar prediction for uh, China. To what do you attribute these very positive numbers coming out of China? Um, I think, first of all, um, as the previous speakers have talked about, that China has taken really draconian measures to contain the virus. So um, China was the first one to ride out of the pandemic and um, you know, kept the virus very much under control. And second of all, I think you know, China has had very sound economic fundamentals, even though the growth has slowed down to 6 point um, some percent, 6 percent last year, um, it's still a very um, high growth rate. Um, not to mention the Chinese government has uh, launched many stimulus um, packages, especially in infrastructure spending and also cash incentives to help businesses and consumers. So I think with these very effective policies and with with a very sound economic basis, um, I think it's not surprising that China is going to forge ahead and grow fast. 
Um, although I think headwinds still remain, um, one thing is the rest of the world is still struggling with the pandemic. Um, and also the US-China relationship can um, continue to worsen. So I think um, you know, the, the government and, uh, needs to still uh, remain vigilant. Yang Liang, you mentioned consumers there. Of course, China uh, has a big uh, consumer population, but it also depends a lot on consumers in other countries. It's an export-oriented economy. So uh, how much concern is there about the rest of the world, uh, the rest of the world's economies joining China? Right. So first of all, I think, you know, China is clearly now trying to rely more on the domestic consumer base. Um, and I think the consumer spending is ratcheting up um, as ev evidenced um, by the Golden Week in October, um, where, you know, 630 million people are traveling and they are spending a total of $70 billion. Um, so they're saying that, you know, retail sales, for example, has finally um, increased by 0.5% in August. So all these are um, positive signs that the Chinese spending, uh, consumer spending is, is uh, restoring, is recovering. Um, for the rest of the world, yes, China is relying also on exports. Um, but China's imports are also increasing. If you're looking at the September, the most recent data, um, China's imports actually have grown by 13%, uh, more than the exports growth. So I think, again, this is a positive sign. On the one hand, the consumers are spending again. And on the other hand, China's imports is, uh, are able to provide a demand boost for the rest of the world. And so um, that would be very helpful. Ayla Tangan, uh, early in the epidemic, of course, Wuhan was the epicenter of the uh, epidemic. It's now been open for months. We see schools have reopened. People have gone back to work. The streets uh, have been open for months. Uh, how critical was that early lockdown in uh, controlling the spread of the pandemic when it started out there? Absolutely crucial. I mean, uh, I, for some reason, it's not talked about in the world. I, I constantly see uh, in international press, and they'll talk about uh, Taiwan, all sorts of, of different places. But rarely is China ever mentioned. But the fact is that you know, China is, is on course, if this newest projection about American deaths is correct, to literally be 1 100th. That means 1% of the number of deaths in China compared to the United States. That's a frightening um, idea, that, especially given the U.S.'s superiority in terms of healthcare uh, apparatus and also sophistication. So, you know, this idea of listening to science, uh, which is taken for granted here in uh, China, was not implemented in the U.S. And you're seeing this really, really stark contrast emerging now, especially, you know, when you see these, um, you know, these these huge campaign rallies, people, many, many without masks, no social distancing, in the most critical kind of environment because, you know, when you have people shouting and yelling, they have determined that this is really uh, the worst kind of place for a super spreader event, and it's just not being stopped. I mean, elsewhere in the world, people are scratching their heads, but, you know, there's this uh, real sense that the U.S. has not completely understood that until you take care of the actual virus, you can't even begin to count or recover in terms of the economics. Yeah, it's become very politicized, yeah. Uh, Richard Cheng, when it comes to issues like uh, mass testing and tracing as well, I mean, you've got to have an infrastructure in place. Um, how important is China's public health care system in combating the pandemic? Well, uh, I, yeah, actually, the Chinese public health public health care system has been very good. Actually, ever you know, for the last uh, seventy years or so, ever since the foundation of the People's Republic, uh, as we all know, uh, back then, seventy years ago, right after or during World War II or before, the uh, infrastructure was pretty poor, and uh, the government has spent uh, has been spending a lot of uh, effort and time and money and manpower. Uh, on this, uh, in this area. So that's been pretty successful. As we all know, uh, a powerful centralized government can do the, when they put their mind and energy into one uh, right justified uh, goal that can be pretty effective. So there's no question about it. But I'd like to uh, change the topic a little bit. I'd like to mention about my thoughts on the lockdowns. You know, there's always a, a, a country, I mean, it's, it's a trade-off uh, between the economic uh, social uh, prices for locking down versus the health uh, issue. My view is that uh, 
Uh, worldwide, I think, you know, we all know it's been very chaotic and uh, the long term lockdown probably has more economic social impact than the disease per se. And my view is that COVID-19 is a bad disease and uh, it's uh, more, a little bit more serious than flu. However, it's not that bad. And then all the data came out to point that the COVID-19 is not a disease to be too afraid of. And uh, what we're seeing in the United States uh, it, it, as part of the problem with the so-called democracy is that uh, people don't listen. And uh, I'm not sure what the earlier comment was that uh, the federal government has all the power. I'm not a politician, I'm not an economist, yeah. but uh, yeah. I do see that uh, the governments have various levels and people, uh, some, pa some people don't really pay attention to this. That is a serious problem. I do support yeah. the temporary short-term lockdowns, but not long. When you say, Dr. Ching, that it's not very dangerous, I mean, if we look here in the United States, 215, 216,000 people have already lost their lives. And as I pointed out earlier on, that figure is expected to go up to somewhere between 300,000 and 400,000 in just a few months. Um, so how do you reconcile it not being dangerous when so many yes, people sir. have died? Yes, sir. That's a great question. That's a very great question. The problem is, the problem is how you measure the mortality rates. In medicine, uh, in epidemiology, as you know, uh, if, you, if, if you really look at, look at those numbers, the, uh, uh, I saw analysis earlier that the people who died with only one diagnosis done as COVID-19, actually percentage is very small. Uh, I don't remember clearly as early, you know, I just woke up and after a long time uh, badminton game last night. But anyway, I thought it was about 9 or 10% of the total number. However, the vast majority of, uh, unfortunately, yeah. they, uh, those, those people who unfortunately died have multiple diagnoses. Okay? Yeah. So as we know, common cold flu, every year occurs on many people. It's not necessarily the, the COVID-19 virus per se. Mm -hmm. It's often, the, you know, as we know, those people who have underlying Immune compromised right. diseases, long term lung or heart disease, and they be lumped together and uh, contribute to COVID 19. So it's, again, like you said, it's very politicized. So how we look at the number is, is quite a is game. Yeah, that's right. People with diabetes and uh, heart conditions, uh, they are more susceptible to yeah. the virus than others. Uh, Peter Chen Hong, yeah. uh, Let's talk about vaccines. That's on the minds of a lot of people. Uh, we heard news on Tuesday that Johnson & Johnson has actually stopped. It's paused its testing of vaccines. That's after one of the test candidates uh, got ill. And we heard just a short while ago that Eli Lilly has actually stopped uh, t tests on an antibody drug that it was uh, working on. Overall, where do things stand as far as vaccines are concerned? Well, and, and I still feel very optimistic about vaccines. Uh, we've been making a lot of rapid progress in vaccines, much faster than any other vaccine until now. Um, the fact that people pause or halt trials is actually part of the name of the game in trials. They're just undergoing a lot more scrutiny right now. But, you know, I think of it as a good sign because it means that trialists and, and companies are invested in safety. And I think, uh, to me, it really doesn't dissuade me from being enthusiastic about the progress of vaccines overall. And Peter, are you hopeful that China would probably have a vaccine soon? Yeah, I mean, I think the Chinese vaccines are making great progress. Um, uh, some of them have been published already in publications like The Lancet, um, and they're, they're using slightly different um, techniques. Some of them are similar, but some of them are using different uh, strategies, for example, live attenuated vac uh, virus compared to fragments of you know, RNA, like uh, some of the US vaccines like Moderna. So I think it takes a village, and it's not going to be necessarily one vaccine that's the savior, but a strategy of multiple vaccines, because we need to use as many as possible once they're effective to get as many people vaccinated as soon as possible. Right. Uh, Yan Liang, I want to go back to the economy for a moment. China's foreign trade uh, has registered strong growth for the third quarter. Uh, how important is it for the global economy, for China to weather uh, the economic fallout from this pandemic? 
That's a great question. So as I mentioned earlier, that you know China's exports have been increasing, um, partly because you know China's economy was the first to recover, and so it kind of shouldered the responsibility of producing a lot of industrial products and also um, PPE. Very importantly, um, according to the WTO, um, China has accounted for about. 45% um, of the total PPE exports in the first half of 2020. And so that means, you know, the recovery of China, the resumption of production is really a bonus for uh, the global economy. Uh, now, uh, China also has increased the imports in the recent uh, uh, months. And so that, like I said, it's also very helpful to provide that demand, which is very necessary for other countries to increase their production. Um, so I think it is important for China to continue to engage um, internationally um, to increase trade with other countries. Anna Tangan, you know, we were talking earlier on about uh, how the pandemic is being discussed here in the United States. It's become a very politicized issue, and there isn't a day that passes that we hear from normally President Trump talking about the China virus, talking about China spreading this, talking about China being responsible for this. He continues uh, to accuse China of being responsible for this. How, do, how is China responding to that kind of talk? Well, I mean, uh, from a pop popular basis, the public is uh, outraged and it's cementing a, a lot of feeling that the U.S. is not the country to follow. Uh, for many, many years, people were interested in democracy, the uh, capitalist system. But between the financial meltdown and how COVID-19 has been handled, uh, that, that has been shaken. Uh, there's more confidence in the government itself. Uh, so, you know, it's just, it's just not uh, gelling very well. I mean, everybody's talking about how there's a negative perception about China among uh, many countries in the world. But the fact is, that is generated by a different process, just simply China growing larger in uncertainty. But for the U.S., this is really, you know, taking down a tremendous number of years of soft power that had evolved. And people, you know, thought of the U.S. in terms of it, you know, being something that they aspire to. I don't think that is true, not only of China, but Europe and the rest of the world. It has been a major uh, turn in terms of perspective. Dr. Cheng, we, of course, are now approaching the winter here in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, and it's a time when more people will be indoors, and there's a likelihood uh, that there'll be more infections. That's the risk that could uh, happen in, in the winter. How well is China prepared for this kind of eventuality? Well, a uh, lot of lot of publication. I mean, uh, pu uh, public, uh, you know, encouragement to education is happening. Uh, asking people. One thing I like to say during this pandemic that uh, with my extensive involvement with the other doctors uh, working on the front line, including uh, you know, those in Shanghai and Wuhan and other places, is that uh, people do pay attention to more attention to prevention here. For example, the nutrition and as a uh, a, a paper just published here um, uh, just came out in an international journal that uh, 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 not as part of the story was that uh, the hospital uh, in central Wuhan, uh, all the people, uh, healthcare staff were distributed vitamin C by uh, with vitamin C powder, they were taking it. And uh, so this has been a part of the uh, you know, vitamin C and uh, these, these nutritional support has been a major part of the the public uh, preventive measure here in China across the across the country actually, and uh, vitamin C and others have been part of the um, the the official guidelines in COVID-19 treatment in Shanghai and Guangdong and other places. I like to point out the, about vaccine, uh, if I may. Mm -hmm. Vaccines, of course, we're all hoping, and as uh, actually the only active measure the worldwide has been expecting, particularly. Uh, the public health officials in the U.S. I like to point out that it's an incomplete measure in dealing with COVID-19. Okay, and uh, you know we all know about vaccines. Let me just point out that the most commonly used vaccine, the flu vaccine. There's a Cochrane research, uh, uh, Cochrane database research reviewing about 50 some clinical trials about flu vaccines worldwide. The re the results are actually marginally effective, I like to point out. It's not as effective as people expected the flu vaccines to be, okay? Now, the question here is that how, uh, how were the COVID-19 vaccines to be? How effective they will be? And, uh, you know, as we are all 
optimistically expecting, but let me just uh, point out the facts, okay? The problem with the flu vaccine is that the flu virus is mutated very easily. Yeah. And in a recent paper in Nature, uh, last month in September, is that there have been 12,000 genetic mutations detecting in COVID-19. So that is a problem. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as we expect this, but uh, I, you know, it's, I'm not so optimistic, okay. let me put it this way. Uh, there will be downsides, yeah. Right. Peter, what are your thoughts on that? Is a vaccine just one component of what would be a broader strategy of uh, beating this virus? Totally. I 100% agree with that. Um, we can't think of the vaccine as a panacea. Uh, the vaccine is one of several strategies. Um, and again, uh, we don't know what the efficacy of the vaccine will be, how many people will actually take the vaccine once it's available. Actually, surveys show that only about 50% of Americans right now, given the distrust of the politics around the vaccines, will stick their arm out tomorrow if it were available. So I think there needs to be a lot of work. And I agree that it's a multi-pronged approach and it's not, you know, a magic t bullet. Right. Yan Liang, you know, before this pandemic uh, outbreak and before the world was swept by this virus, China was involved in some pretty ambitious projects around the world. And one that comes to mind immediately, of course, is the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, could projects like that be affected in the in the years to come? Yes, I think uh, one of the biggest concerns um, is the debt uh, level of many of the developing countries. They're the you know BRI partners. Um, so take Africa for example. I think you know there is a huge concern about you know how these countries are battling with the pandemic. They're seeing their uh, uh, you know uh, slower growth and slower um, GDP. So they will have difficulties to pay off their debt. And China is one of the biggest creditors um, to some of these African countries. In 2018, for example, China has lent 150 billion dollars um, to these countries. Um, now these lendings are very useful, very uh, you know, instrumental. For example, in Kenya, they built railroads. Um, in Tanzania, they built ports and special economic zones. I think, if anything, yeah. uh, the pandemic shows you know how interconnected these countries are and how important the digital infrastructures are. So I think it's important for China to continue um, to invest. Um, yeah, at the same time, I think it's important for China yeah. to, uh, you know, take more measured approach um, to think about debt sustainability uh, and the bankable projects and the returns. I right, know very quickly, one final question. Uh, I've only got about 30 seconds. We're hearing a new term now, COVID-19 fatigue. We see numbers going up in Europe. We see numbers spiraling in places like Russia. Uh, how is Chinese society dealing with the fact that this is a virus, this is a pandemic that's going to be around for quite some time? Uh, quite frankly, the, the Chinese believe in results and what they see the government doing has given them a tremendous amount of confidence. That's why you're getting fatigue in these countries, because the, uh, in essence, the governments have mishandled uh, the COVID-19, resulting in a loss of confidence in the government and therefore kind of this idea, throw up your hands, it doesn't matter anymore. Okay, we have to end it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us. And we need to leave it there. Thanks for joining us on another edition of The Heat.